So Gabe, I am really grateful for you coming here again. Uh, this is an amazing opportunity for me to really ask you some of the most important questions that I could think about. But this is by no means an exhaustive list, and I hope that we will do this again sometime. Um, one of the first questions that I've always wanted to ask someone from Graphene OS is, why would you even do it? And what's the purpose behind the project and the operating system itself? So first of all, thank you very much for having me on your show. I'm very excited to talk to you about Graphene OS today. So Graphene OS originally started in 2014, and it was started up by Daniel McKay. And originally he was porting the OpenBSD memory allocator to the Bionic libc. And he ported some of the PAX patch set to a few of the devices which were supported. And from then on, he began doing loads of low-level hardening. And quite a lot of that has actually been sent upstream into AOSP and now runs on billions of devices. And since then, Graphene OS has pretty much become what I would describe as an active research project where we have a goal of producing a reasonably private and secure operating system, which aims to pretty much be usable by anyone today. So this was more like a, a gradual development of someone's passion for security. The Graphene OS you know today is an evolution of what was many years ago, just a personal project is now evolved into a production grade operating system, which thousands of users use every day. And I think that <laughs> it's got a very long and fruitful future ahead of it. Yeah, that's that's what I hope for, for sure, definitely. I heard of Graphene OS from Edward Snowden. He tweeted about this, and that's why I personally decided to install Graphene OS, because I just trust someone who just escaped the NSA. So. Without understanding too much about this, the system, I didn't even know what I was doing, but could you explain what Graphene OS is doing differently from the alternatives out there? Graphene OS has a goal of producing an operating system which has systemic privacy and security improvements. So we're investing substantial amounts of effort into, into eliminating actual vulnerability classes simultaneously, rather than just focusing on cherry picking low hanging fruit or just picking out vulnerabilities which have not yet been patched by AOSP and just backporting them. We're actually improving the overall security model of the operating system, and we're adding in meaningful privacy and security defenses. Mm. Graphene OS is available almost exclusively, well, pretty much exclusively to Pixel devices. I mean, it probably some people could, could run it on some other devices, but officially you guys only support the Google's flagship phones or their um, mid-tier phones as well. For some people, this raises eyebrows who are not really familiar with why you would make this decision. So could you please explain, like, why would you create this secure and a private operating system on a device that is owned by a company that, that is notoriously known for invading people's privacy? So when it comes to Pixel phones, they're actually generally regarded as being sort of king of the hill when it comes to privacy and security within the hardware. And generally today, they trade blows and in some cases outclass the only other real competitor they have, which is the iPhone. So why we use them ourselves is, well, for one, they really do stick out the entire crowd when you look at the entire Android ecosystem. And that's because they're the only Android devices which have proper firmware level support for alternative operating systems. So that means that if any of you have ever installed Graphene OS on your phone before, you'll see that you have a little warning screen that you boot your phone, which has a sort of yellow theme to it. And that means your phone is booting in the yellow verified boot state. So whereas the normal operating system would boot within the green state, the yellow state means that you've installed a user-defined root of trust. And what that means is Google's Pixel phones and a few other devices, but they don't do it securely, allow you to run your own operating system signed with your own signing keys on the phone and preserve all the security features that the phone has to offer, such as verified boot. Another thing that Pixels have, which people aren't necessarily aware of, is they have firmware level support for full MAC address randomization and a few other Wi-Fi privacy features. So a naive implementation, which is only in software, might not take into account things like packet sequence numbers which are uh, essentially sent out in a way which cannot make the device uniquely identifiable. 
There's also a, obviously sort of how would I say this? The almost near flagship feature of the Pixel device when you're looking at it from a security perspective, and that's the Titan M, or otherwise the Titan M2 on sixth generation Pixel devices. So the Titan M, which I'm just going to refer to collectively, including the Titan M and the Titan M2, provides quite a few different security features. So it's a dedicated hardware secure element, and it acts as a hardware strong box for the operating system. So Android Key Store uses it. Um, that's where secret management, things like that happen. And it also has support for the Weaver API, which means that the secure element throttles attempts to unlock the phone when data is at rest. So say you shut down your phone and then turn it on, your data is going to be at rest because you haven't yet unlocked it. And that means essentially, say for example, someone wants to try and brute force your phone, they aren't really going to be able to do that because they're going to be rate limited very heavily by the secure element. And that's what Weaver is. It's essentially highly robust rate limiting, which is enforced by the secure element, which means that you don't have to rely on necessarily a very long and strong passcode, but instead the Titan M can literally make a four digit passcode reasonably secure because it can withstand these brute force attempts so well. And I'd say that is a pretty good Oh yeah, that is. Although I do have some follow-up questions, if I may. What if somebody, an adversary, removes physically removes the Titan M chip from this and tries to brute force the encryption passphrase? That's going to be impossible because the Titan M is what contains the actual secrets. And the Titan M is actually hardened against all sorts of things. It's got hardening against... It's like literally got... How would I explain this? It's got... In a sense, it's essentially in a cage of wires where, say, someone takes it apart and they change how those wires are set up or they cut a wire, it's going to produce a different result when it essentially checks itself. And that means you will never be able to unlock the phone again. It's also got things like temperature sensors. So it'll, it might, it'll automatically just nuke itself when it's too cold or too warm. And I don't know if I mentioned this, but it's literally resistant to lasers. They fired lasers at the thing. So they know what they're doing. It's possibly one of the best secure elements you can get on the mobile device. That's actually pretty fascinating that I, that I thought about this. This is really like trying to build an impenetrable device. So if somebody picks up your phone and they're trying to brute force it, this this throttle feature that's built into it, that they're not going to get around it. Yeah, it, it's not going to happen. And the Titan M also has a very cool feature, which I've missed out on. And that's called insider attack resistance. So you might jump back to a few years ago to where you had the San Bernardino shooter and the US government had the terrorist's iPhone and they wanted to try and force Apple to unlock it. That situation can never happen on a Pixel device because of, well, the previously mentioned insider attack resistance. Now, what does that actually mean? So it means that in order to load firmware to the Titan M, you have to have the phone unlocked. So it's impossible for be it a malicious employee or Google being forced by a court order to make custom firmware to unlock your phone. So what you're saying is that Google went out of its way to remove itself from your, your phone. They've essentially eliminated themselves as being a possibility for, say, a government entity or a malicious employee from getting access to a Pixel phone. Assuming it's at rest in this in this situation, mm -hmm. this is this is very impressive that they would go out of its way to do this because, as far as I am aware, this is unheard of. Like I I don't know of any other device, desktop or mobile, that would do this. So there is another secure element called the Qualcomm SPU, and a few devices ship with that, and a few devices ship with Weaver. And a few devices actually have insider attack resistance, which is backed by the SPU. However, it's completely optional. It's completely optional for an OEM to implement Weaver on it. So you're kind of hoping that your OEM has set this up, but all pixels have it enabled. So it varies based on the device. So it doesn't matter where I buy my Pixel phone, it's, this feature is going to be enabled. On all yes. of them? Yes. Okay. All right. You mentioned 
verified boot that Graphene OS is able to preserve this with uh, the Pixel device because the architecture allows it to, you know, flash your own operating system with your own signing keys. But why is it even important to have verified boot on your device? Other operating systems, you know, alternatives to Android, Android forks are not too concerned with this. Why is it important to Graphene OS? So verified boot is pretty much a baseline requirement for any production Android operating system. And Pixel phones have the unique feature of being able to preserve this with not an operating system. Now, why is this important? So people who might have done a little bit of research into it might just wrongly assume, but it's understandable why, assume that it's solely just to prevent an attacker who has your phone physically from changing the operating system. Now, that's just one threat it's actually meant to defend against. It's actually defending against another major threat, and that is persistence. So you might not be aware of what persistence means, but say I'm a threat actor and I've installed my covert, ma covert malware onto your phone. It means that it's very hard for me to persist, i.e. persist between a reboot um, on the phone because I can't just write myself into the operating system because it's read only, it's fully verified by the bootloader and beyond that there isn't many many places I can persist within. Some exploits at the end of their full exploit chain they might install an accessibility service and that's what they'll use for persistence and that's a very common way for adversaries to persist on an Android device. Yeah, and I think there is um, another threat that the verified boot is trying to prevent or, or defend against. And I think that's um, um, rollback attacks. These are attacks that are trying to regress the version of your Android to, the, yeah. to, to an older version that has some known vulnerabilities and attack that version uh, of your phone, if I'm interpreting this correctly. Yes, so anti-rollback protection is, say for example, we have just a stock pixel operating system. You know, one update a month, each update's normally just a security update. It means that you can't downgrade the phone from the April security patch to the March security patch. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. much as simple as that. It stops you from being able to downgrade your phone. Of course, if you, the user for whatever reason, want to downgrade your phone, which is probably a bad idea, but if you do, you can always just, you know, unlock the bootloader and, you know, do it yourself. But the idea the idea is is that an adversary won't be able to just sideload or, you know, force the OS to downgrade itself. It's just not going to be possible. The bootloader won't allow it. And that's also part of why being able to lock the bootloader is so important, because locking the bootloader is the only way to fully preserve the verified boot threat model. Yeah, and every time you lock or unlock your bootloader, it erases the content of the, of the phone. Yep, precisely for the reason that if you were just able to freely unlock and lock the phone, well, then you'd be kind of negating the, the security features that are there present within the device. So yeah, that's why it's wiped. So just to recap this question, you chose Pixel devices for a few reasons. One of them is the security properties of the Pixel architecture are just unparalleled on the Android eco ecosystem, and they are even some in some some instances they are even better than the iPhone implementation. And another reason is this uh, liberty that for some reason Google decided to give Pixel users that you are able to just you know use the device without Google even having any presence on that device, which is pretty ironic. But this is how it is. And um, I would say Graphene OS has made so many significant improvements, but it is fundamentally a fork, let's say, of the Android open source project, of the Android operating system. So a lot of the things that Graphene OS or Daniel Nikkei himself have made, all of these contributions, they've actually made their way back to the Android operating system that's available now to all Android users, making Android more secure, for billions of users and not just the users of Graphene OS. And I just wanted someone from the Graphene OS to just brag about this a little bit because I think there is, it is impossible to overestimate how important this is. So could you maybe just lay out some of the most significant improvements 
that Graphene OS has made in the past that are now present in the Android open source project? Absolutely. That's perfectly fine. So just a few things that are going to come to mind, first of all. So Graphene OS has actually upstreamed many low-level hardening features to AOSP over the years. And just a few off the top of my head, uh, for example, we vastly improved the fortified source implementation within the Bionic libc, and we deployed stack canaries throughout the entirety of the operating system. So what does that mean? Since I doubt too many people within the audience will know. So a common source of vulnerabilities in software. Um, I think, I believe the statistic was from Google as of a few years ago, I'm not sure if that's still current, where there's roughly 80% of vulnerabilities within Android are due to memory unsafety issues. So parts of the operating system which are written in C or C++. And by upstreaming all that low level hardening that I just formally mentioned, we're eliminating certain classes of those memory unsafety vulnerabilities and we're drastically reducing the risk of those happening. Another feature that we upstreamed to AOSP is a few years ago, we added the hide PID equals two option for slash proc, which I'm sure Linux users will be familiar with. And what that means is, is that as of, I believe if memory serves me right, Android 7, apps are no longer able to use slash proc to find out what processes are running on your phone. So they're not gonna be able to figure out what apps you're running, that kind of thing. So now that's all hidden away safely behind the proper usage access permission, which you have to explicitly grant as a user. So that's a nice privacy and security improvement. And of course, through our research and through our various hardening improvements we've done over the years, we found dozens upon dozens upon dozens of issues. And we've all reported those and in some cases fixed those ourselves like I mentioned this in a, another talk. We fixed a use after free vulnerability, which was uncovered by our hardened memory allocator called hardened malloc. That's being tracked as CVE 2021-0703, which is essentially for, the, for those who aren't familiar with security, it's a tracking number for a security vulnerability. And we also do various different types of audits internally as part of our research. Like I helped find a vulnerability in the pixel bootloader and that was tracked as CVE 2021-39653. If you want to look that up and find out what the, the implications were of that. And together we found quite a few security vulnerabilities and we fixed them. So ultimately we are along with, alongside our defense in depth improvements we've made quite a sizable contribution to ensuring that billions of Android users who might not necessarily be running Graphene OS are benefiting from our improvements. Yeah, and I think that this is something that's going to sound like a foreign concept to a lot of people who are not familiar with how these things work. Because you are working for a Graphene OS, which essentially is a non-profit, but all your contributions, while you own them, are essentially open source. And when they go to the AOSP, which is open source Android, it means that everyone is benefiting from this. There is like no single entity that holds this code as a proprietary piece of their work. Like is the case with, for example, Apple, Apple products or all the other proprietary products. So you're essentially giving away your work to everyone um, for free, not in terms of like free as in cost, but free as in that everyone can use this. And now because of this, billions of people, even those that are never even heard of Graphene OS are benefiting th from this. So th this is fascinating to me. And now I'm wondering actually, why is Graphene OS even its separate entity? Why is it not hired by Google or someone to do Graphene OS or essentially turn Android into Graphene OS? Wow. I guess we then knock on the door of Google and ask. Although we are very friendly to anyone that would be interested in us helping them integrate our hardening work. And ultimately we do want to make Android as safe as possible. And we are motivated in getting our changes upstream to benefit billions of users. All right, so there are there, there is no chance right now that um, uh, you would be essentially turning Android into, into Graphene OS. Graphene OS is just going to be ahead of Android as it stands right now as its own separate project. 
I'm just wondering, like, why wouldn't Android make all these security improvements as Graphene OS is doing? Well, there are quite a few improvements which Upstream AOSP has done, which were either inspired by us or based on changes which we have done. And obviously not everything can be incorporated, but over time, I do believe that a lot of our features are going to land upstream. Like Google recently has been investing quite a substantial amount into cellular and baseband security internally. And we've had the LTE only toggle for quite a few years now in Graphene OS. And Google rolled out a, a toggle with similar aims, which allows you to completely disable 2G on a device. And I think there is quite a close overlap in both what Google is doing internally and what Graphene OS is doing. And I think as time goes on, more and more Graphene OS features, be they be upstreamed by us or be they incorporated in a different form by Google are going to make it into the core AOSP project. And something to bear in mind as well, we actually develop Graphene OS as a drop-in replacement for AOSP. So if you're actually building a device which uses AOSP as at its core, you're actually able to pretty much drop in Graphene OS and use that as the base of your device. So that's something that we quite heavily rely on when we're doing our work. So we want, say for example, I don't know, uh, let me just throw, I'm not going to say a name actually, otherwise people are going to think I'm associated with them. But say an OEM decides to release a new phone. They can, right now, completely free if they want to, reuse the Graphene OS code base and use that to base their new Android device off of instead of AOSP. Yeah, that's that's amazing. So that would actually create its own Graphene OS ecosystem. It's entirely possible that might be something we see in the future. And it's also not just mm. phones per se, but say for example, and I say this example sometimes just to get the point across, like say for example, I don't know, some companies building a cash machine or a vending machine, they can run Graphene OS on it if they want. And that portability is what I personally think makes the appeal and long-term growth of the project sustainable because people are going to be actively using our changes and there's substantial incentive for these changes to be incorporated upstream into the core AOSP project. I mean, this is this is amazing. Are we going to have a Graphene OS car in the future? Well, <laughs> nah, I'm just kidding. Well, we never know. Technically, the Graphene OS could be converted to run Android Automotive OS, but, um, well, we have no plans to release a car yet, I'm afraid. <laughs> All right, that's, that's fine. Um, what about maybe some wearables? I think Pixel is try um, Google is trying to release some Pixel Watch later this year. So is th is that going to be portable? Um, at the moment, it's a matter of I really don't know. So okay, historically the watch ecosystem hasn't been as open, and generally Google's other Android devices, which aren't Pixels, don't have alternate operating system support. So it's to be seen whether or not a port of Graphene OS would be possible. And even if alternate operating system support is present, it might not be done under the Graphene OS branding. It's something that will have to be seen once that time comes pretty much. At the moment, it's all speculation. What about TV? <laughs> I'm sorry, I just cannot resist. Well, it's still possible. It's So I'd say don't rule it out, but at the moment, Google isn't releasing any Android TV devices. Well, they have the Chromecasts, but those don't support alternate operating systems. But I mean, sure, right. if you want to run Android TV based off Graphene OS, you probably can do that. I mean, yeah, th this this is something like um, you, you've mentioned how all these if improvements have been made uh, thanks to your work and how there is this incentive for others to also contribute and grow this ecosystem of a secure mobile operating system. And we previously talked um, outside of our talk here about some optimistic changes that are likely going to happen in the future. And maybe if you could rehearse some of those, some of that optimism here, maybe maybe share, share your thoughts here, because there's a lot of doomerism out there about like how the data collection and AI is just going to ruin our lives. But there's a lot of significant improvement, especially in the mobile 
operating system sphere and that's that's something that people are actually not very familiar with that yeah your phone is actually the most secure device out of all of your devices out there like your tablets or well tablets are pretty similar but like um, TVs or computers laptops like your phone is very secure and you've mentioned some developments that could actually make it even more secure so would you would you want to jump into this so yeah I do think that the Android ecosystem, and the same goes for iOS, really, in a sense, but I'm, I'm more knowledgeable about Android, um, is going to evolve as time goes on. Like, I'm aware, for example, internally at Google, they're working on improving and just being aware of some of the designs that are being put forward for things like identity documents being stored on your phone. I think that the future is looking quite positive because, as far as I can tell, careful consideration is being taken to ensure that things like say, say for example, you have your driving license on your phone, the, the threat model of say, for example, a rogue police officer or your phone being snatched from you is being taken well into account. And I think given that I'm seeing actual work being done internally, just by seeing what people at Google are doing, I think that ultimately it is going to bring about a positive change for consumers with regards to security and it could mean for example say when you show your id at like i don't know a nightclub that it just shows that you're of the correct age and it doesn't have to show your like address or name to the bouncer or anything like that and i think technologies like that have got good potential to bring a lot of good to the world but it's important to be aware of how these technologies could be implemented wrongly but I generally believe that we're heading into the right place when it comes to these things. And I think uh, just looking at the opinions of some of the Android security team members, I think we are heading in the right direction when it comes to integration of things like that. I just I just uh, wanted to follow up with um, the optimism on this because there has been pretty significant improvement made by Google itself, like the company that everyone sees as this horrible evil. And, you know, there, there's been a fair share of criticism thrown at this company but Google has made some improvements in how they handle sensitive user data when they want to make calculations on the data and deliver their services in a personalized manner and some of these implementations include something like fed ready learning which basically means they are trying to do the training on the device so that your data does not actually have to even leave the device but the training model can still be updated and improved for everyone else. And then there's differential privacy. And many people would be surprised to hear that Google's implementation of differential privacy is actually miles better than Apple's because Apple's is completely closed in, closed off. And uh, it's supposed to be open source so that it, sh it should be transparent because the only way to, to verify whether differential privacy is implemented properly is to see it. And Apple is tight-lipped about it, but Google has released it. And they also released their Epsilon values, which are better, miles better than, than Apple. So that's not what a lot of people are talking about. Google also, in, in, since 2018, has been offering end-to-end -end encrypted Android backup, backups that are encrypted with your uh, lock screen password or passphrase. And uh, that's something that not even Apple is providing. So, and that's something that, you know, no one knows about because Google never, never, you know, did any marketing campaign for this. So it's like we should give credit where credit is due. due. And when these um, implementations are done properly, as you said, with the driving licenses, for example, if it's, if they are thinking about these threat models that are essential to a lot of people, especially vulnerable people, we should applaud them for this. And I'm, I'm also optimistic that with the mobile security and privacy, we, we, we are definitely going to see major improvements in the future and we are, we are going the right direction. That's, that's my take. I, I would agree with that. I think that overall, the future is looking bright. And I think over the next few years, I think everyone will be able to benefit from gradual privacy and security improvements. Yeah. And Speaking of driving licenses, would you be able to talk about like Fido implementation into Graphene OS and web authentication? So at the moment, we've actually been in touch with the Chromium team at Google 
and just just for a brief update so just for context as not everyone might be aware so on android devices at the moment fido is handled by google play services so on graphene os for now you'll need to install sandbox google play and you'll need to use a third party web browser the reason for that is google play services currently has a whitelist of browsers which are allowed to use fido so we're just currently waiting for Google for, for Google to add us to their whitelist. And once that happens, you'll be able to use Fido in Vanadium with Sandbox Google Play. And um, based on a very brief discussion with the Chromium team, it is looking like potentially in the future, um, AOSP itself is going to have Fido support. So you won't even need to use Sandbox Google Play, which is gonna be great for everyone that doesn't want to do that. So yeah, I think that's gonna be something to look forward to in, in the coming months. So are you personally excited about this? Because there are um, Fido keys out there and, you know, some people love them, some people don't because they say, well, you can lose them and, you know, what then? But with your phone, you could use your phone to actually authenticate your uh, account information or signing information. So are you personally excited about this or would you still rather use like a separate hardware token for signing in or two-factor authentication? I personally think that being able to leverage the Titan M as a two-factor device is going to be huge. And so at the moment, we are planning to make that an accessible thing for all apps on the device. Um, it is a planned feature, so that's separate from what I previously mentioned. And me personally, I think I definitely use it. It's convenient. I don't have to lug around. I don't know. Well, I have my uh, security key on my keychain, but of course, if I forget my keys or I don't know, I'm downstairs and I don't want to walk upstairs and fetch my keys or something like that, I can just use my phone to authenticate to say my Google account and someone like me or a journalist who's on the advanced protection program for Google, where you have to log into your Google account with security keys and you're not allowed to just rely on a password. You, you'll, you have to use security keys as a two-factor authentication method. I think that's going to be very useful as it makes it a lot more convenient. Yeah, that's, an, that's another uh, thing to be hopeful about in the future. I, I still don't understand why Google hasn't released uh, the, their Fido implementation in the, into the AOSP. Do you have any thoughts on this? Like why it is implemented into the Play Services? I completely understand why they integrated into play services. And if I was in part in charge of the engineering team, I probably would have done the same thing. And the reason being is that ultimately Android, like it or not, is pretty fragmented. And when you've got over a billion different devices, which all are running different Android versions, some are getting updates, some aren't getting updates, you need a portable way to distribute new features to all of them. That's why Google has added it to Play Services. As Play Services, well, it's on pretty much almost all of those devices. And it's a great way to quickly deploy, say, a new feature or, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. just for example, say, oh, here's a great explanation of um, a feature that they recently are or have added in, I'm not sure. Uh, they have the Bluetooth scanning feature so I'm sure everyone's aware of the Apple AirTag and how on an iPhone device, it will alert you if there's um, an unknown AirTag tracking you, i.e. you've got like, I don't know, say you've had one slipped in your pocket or in your wallet, something like that. Android devices, which are running Play services, are now gonna be able to warn you. And that feature is gonna be deployed on tons of devices because that's been deployed as part of Play services rather than being part of the Android operating system. And again, this is something that I think as time goes on, Google might eventually deploy it to AOSP. And from the looks of it, it's looking like they most likely are going to deploy Fido keys to AOSP, which is, and this is obviously the same rationale they have for placing Fido into play services in order to deliver it to all of these billions of users on billions of different devices, billions of different Android versions. You get the idea. And it's a great way to deploy a feature to all these different devices. and. I think this is one of the few advantages which Google has by having such immense control over the ecosystem. It means that, say for example, I don't know, tomorrow a new special type of security key comes out and they need to update, I don't know, 
normally if it was integrated as part of AOSP, you'd need an OS update to do it. But because it's all in because it's all in place services, just one place services update and that's it. You have support for the new type of security key. And I think having the ability to be flexible like that is crucial when you're maintaining such a large and fragmented ecosystem. And I think as Android devices become more and more modular in the sense that we have initiatives at Google such as generic kernel images and project mainline where bits of the OS can be updated out of band by Google Play, I think that's going to drastically improve how features are delivered. And maybe at some point in the future, we'll even get to a point where mainline will actually allow you to deliver new features to your Android device, which I personally think could well, well definitely happen in a long future. You, you told me that I don't have to worry about the time. So I would like to, if, if we still have the time, I, w- I would like to talk about some of the features that Graphene OS provides. Some of the security sure, sure, features sure. Yeah, that are that are like probably the most significant ones for you. And maybe I would mention some of the ones that I personally like. Um, I definitely love that the MAC address is fully randomized, making my Pixel device completely anonymous to any network that I connect to. I love... Um, the profile feature that enables me to create ephemeral profiles based on the identities that I need to use. This is something that doesn't get enough credit, I think, because people often just like create their account on their phone and they install all of their apps into this one account. And that could be a potential exposure of your sensitive data. But you could do that on other Android phones, but with Graphene OS, you can have, multi- you can have 15 different profiles or 16 altogether with the guest. And in these profiles, you can run applications like the Sandbox Google Play services alongside some other apps that you don't want to have exposed to your main profile where you have some other sensitive data. What are some other security features, or if you want to comment on on the profiles, feel free to do so, that you think are most significant to the end user that Graphene OS exclusively provides? Graphene OS has multiple different security features and just additions which you've made to the operating system. So as you just mentioned, it does support multiple user profiles. So the ability to have multiple users has been an Android feature for a very long time, but Graphene OS has extended it so that you have the end session button on all profiles. And what that means is, is that you literally can just press the button and it will completely wipe the profile from RAM and it will put it back to encrypted at rest. And each profile has its own Weaver slot, which means it has its own encryption keys and you can have a separate passcode for each profile. And additionally, what Graphene OS does with regard to profiles, it actually increases the amount of profiles which you can create. So normally, please forgive me if I get this wrong, my memory says that it's going to be roughly four by default on a normal Android installation that you get with the stock OS. And Graphene OS increases that to 16. So yeah. generally, it's quite flexible with regard to what you can do. Not everyone has to use it, uh, but for people who do, some people might, for example, confine all their apps which rely on play services into one profile. They might have one profile per identity. Say, for example, they have one for all their social media in real life, and they have one just for their internet alias, things like that. And I think it's a good way for people to be able to compartmentalize what they do on their phone. And a lot of our community does that. And in my opinion, I'd say it works pretty well. We also have an abundance of other security features. So I'm literally just going to pick up my phone and scroll through. And like, for example, on my phone, I've got the Wi-Fi timeout feature enabled, which means, say, for example, I connect to a Wi-Fi network and then after a bit of time I disconnect from it say I just popped into I don't know Starbucks and I connected their Wi-Fi so once I walk away from Starbucks and say I just didn't bother to turn the Wi-Fi off on my phone my phone's eventually going to disconnect from the access point and Graphene notes that you that you configure a timer so from the moment it disconnects I can say all right five minutes after it disconnects turn off the Wi-Fi And that's a great bit of attack surface reduction as it drastically reduces the phone's susceptibility to remote code execution via Wi-Fi, which is quite a key entry point when it comes to um, attacks that can be done within a near physical presence of the device. Or potentially remotely even if an adversary were to compromise, say, a Wi-Fi route or something like that. But that's not something most people need to consider about in their threat model. 
And we have a bunch of other things as well. Like for example, we have the auto reboot timer. So what that means is say, for example, say this is configurable or so. So say for example, I say, all right, after four hours of not unlocking my device, my phone's going to reboot. And what that means is, is that after that reboot, all the data within memory is going to be wiped. The phone is now at a state where all data is at rest, meaning that the full protection of the Titan M is now enacted upon the device until you then unlock it and continue to use it again. So that's quite handy. Say, for example, you might be a protester. Uh, the police take your device. That means that you could configure that while you're at the process, if you don't unlock it after, I don't know, say one hour, the phone will automatically reboot. Um, I wanted to actually follow up on this. Um, mm -hmm. One of the features that I love about Graphene OS, and it's not available anywhere else, again, which I think is stupid, and it's the internet toggle and Graphene OS, Graphene OS is unique firewall. And that allows me to, for example, if I install an app that I don't trust, but I still want to like, you know, check it out, and I think that this app could extract some data that I find to be invasive, I can just disable network access to this app, and I don't even have to use an application, a third-party application firewall for this. I can just do this straight from my Graphene OS um, app permission dashboard. This is an amazing feature. And also, could you expand on this? How strong this feature is? If I disable internet connection for the app, is there any way for the app to escape the, that um, that permission and like send an intent to some other app or something like that, try to communicate some data outside of that phone? So the Graphene OS um, network permission is actually the is actually completely revoking the internet permission from an app. So unlike say an application based firewall, um, it's not leaky whatsoever, and it cannot be leaky. And it's fully it's fully robust. It's completely safeguarded. It basically cannot leak. So just something to note: revoking the network permission does not revoke the ability for the app to talk to other apps where both apps have mutually consented to communications. So that's what would be referred to as inter-process communication. And the main thing to be aware of is generally these communications only happen where both apps have mutually consented. So it's not like, I don't know, application X can just tell application Y all your secrets and everything. No, it's generally not going to be that. It will be more like, for example, Google Play Services is allowing all apps to use inter process communication to talk to it so they can get notifications, for example. Things like that. Yeah. Um, I actually forgot to ask this question when we were talking about the hardened memory allocator, but I think it would be important for people uh, to understand why this is important. You mentioned that 80% of um, exploits in, um, or vulnerabilities in the in the Android operating system used to be based on m memory corruption. What, what is the abuse for, for these vulnerabilities? How, how, can, how can these vulnerabilities be exploited by malicious actors that Graphene OS is mitigating when it, with the har hardened uh, memory allocator? So ultimately, all vulnerabilities are potentially a risk for something to bypass the security model. So say, for example, there could be, I don't know, let me think of something. There could be a buffer overflow, which could be triggered when you open a specially crafted, I don't know, image. So that would mean that an adversary could potentially send you an image that's been specially crafted that takes advantage of this memory unsafety vulnerability within the device. And it could allow you to essentially subvert the security model. It could mean that that image could then let you, I don't know, well, not let you, but let the adversary execute their code by taking advantage of the vulnerability, things like that. And I think it's important to mention that not all of these are necessarily going to be within the threat model. Like, I doubt most people listening to this are going to be, I don't know, of any interest to someone who quite literally has a multi-million dollar exploit chain at their disposal. Like, nobody's realistically going to be attacked because just just because they watch this video or anything like that it's more being 
aware that things like such as, for example, mass exploitation, where, for example, a vulnerability is sprayed across as many devices as possible. Like, I personally think the future is going to be where, say, for example, someone exploits a vulnerability on your device and they'll be able to ransomware it, for example, something like that. And I think it's very important to be aware of the inherent risks that vulnerabilities can pose. Yeah, so so I just wanted to know, like, um, what kind of abuse and exploits is uh, the hardened mail preventing? And it's not just about the vulnerabilities themselves, but it's also about how adversaries could actually abuse these vulnerabilities. So if you could, like, give an example or maybe just say generally um, what the benefit of having a hardened memory allocator is on a graphene OS. So as with any defense in depth improvement, and I guess you could say this for a great degree of defensive practices done within information security. You can imagine, say, a standard pixel device with the standard operating system being a pretty reasonably secured door. And it might take, I don't know, say a locksmith a good few hours to get into it. And then if you were to compare it to a pixel phone running Granophene OS, just for the sake of the analogy, we can imagine the Graphene OS phone as being a much more secure door with, I don't know, reinforced concrete all around it and having iron bars on the windows. And that means that a lock, it might take a locksmith, I don't know, days or weeks even to get in compared to hours on the stock operating system. That's not to say that Graphene OS is immune to hacking, nothing is, but it does significantly increase the bar for an adversary so it means that an adversary might well have to spend more time, more money, more effort, more resources into fully compromising a Graphene OS device compared to a device running the stock operating system. So this might be just a speculative question, but if you could estimate, like we know that on the market, a standard zero day exploit chain for stock Android device would be at around $2.5 million. So you're saying that for Graphene OS, that would be like $10 million for the for the similar exploit chain? I don't think giving a figure is possible, but I can tell you for a start, like, like I even still, I think 2.5 million, even for a normal Android device is underpriced. Most of the prices that you see advertised as part of bug, bug bounty programs or things like that, are generally going to be well under the value that you could get for an exploit chain if you, I don't know, say sold it for a government or sold it to, I don't know, a hacking organization or a spyware organization. They will generally pay far more. And usually because, of course, you know, you have the burden of it being sort of like, um, what's the right word, anti-ethical potentially, and it often is. And that's why the price is so high. And it's also because it's a very high skill task in order to be able to produce something of this, something that can actually, you know, fully compromise a modern device. And in Graphene OS, I think we, it might add definitely a couple million and it could require far more, far more people working on an exploit chain. But honestly, it's all speculative and it's very hard to really give a precise figure. Why is it so expensive to build an exploit chain that would probably be used only on one person? So the main thing to understand when it comes to why these exploit chains are so costly is that when you look at, say, a modern operating system like Android or iOS, they were built from the ground up, in a sense, getting ready for the future, a future which is actively hostile on, with regards to uh, threat actors actively abusing vulnerabilities across the internet and within their envisioning of the operating system, it's quite important for them to ensure that their users are protected. They have a vested interest in ensuring that their devices are secure and private so they can deter threat actors from targeting those devices. Of course, as we see in the news constantly, the right amount of money and a skilled enough threat actor will find a way in. I think that will always be a case, but I think there's so much defense in depth improvements happening across the Android space and and honestly across over 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 the hedge in 
the land of Apple and iOS, they're happening there as well. I think it's going to drastically drive up the cost for adversaries. And with the introduction of technologies such as our memory tagging, I think that's going to drive the cost up even more as attackers move away from memory unsafety related issues and they move towards exploiting logic related issues within the operating system. Well, this is definitely something that I am looking forward to because mo most people, they are just trusting their devices and they don't fully realize how much work has been put into making those devices secure. And in most cases, when people get compromised, I don't, I'm not going to say most because I don't know the statistics, but in a lot of cases, you know, people are going to be making mistakes. But what I really appreciate about these efforts in mobile operating systems is that they're trying to be foolproof. Like, for example, I love that I don't even have to think about graphing OS. Like before graphing OS, I, I tried to use cubes, right? And for those who are not familiar with cubes, it's a desktop operating system that's, try, that's, it, that's trying to like build a secure and a private experience through compartmentalization. So everything is running inside a VM, virtual machine. But with, and th the problem with cubes is that there's such a steep learning curve and not just when you try to install it, that's actually the easiest part. It's when you're trying to use it on a daily basis and it's just gonna drain your battery life. It's, you, you need to have a beefy machine. But Graphene OS is so simple even the installation process, but the usage is simple. Like I don't have to learn anything new. I can just use it as my daily driver. I don't have to like tr troubleshoot anything. I don't have to worry about anything. All of my apps work in Graphene OS and you did all the hard work so that I can be more secure. I, I think this needs to be appreciated. Like the, the work that you're doing, like you're, you're doing the thinking for the user so that user doesn't have to be consciously mindful of their own security and potentially make mistakes. For other questions that I was thinking about is, Graphene OS is easy to use, but still, it's not, to my knowledge, it's not available to on any consumer-grade device at the moment. So some people are offering, like, reselling Pixel devices with Graphene OS pre-installed on it. What are your thoughts on this? Is this secure? Is this something that people should be buying? So I think maybe a few years ago, it would have made a lot more sense for somebody to buy a device with the operating system pre-installed. But now that we have the web installer, which means that you can install Graphene OS yourself with a step-by-step -step GUI guide, where you just plug in the cable, plug in your phone to your computer, or even another Android phone if you want, you can install it straight through the web browser and you get the same security and you don't really compromise on anything. And I think because of that, it decreases the real need for resellers. But I understand that there, of course, will still be people who want to buy such a device. And really my personal advice would be make sure you run an auditor on the device to ensure that it's the real genuine Graphene OS that you're, you've got on your newly purchased device. And pretty much beyond that, that's the best thing you can possibly do in order to ensure that the device is safe and secure. And if you really don't want to trust it, you can always, you know, install the operating system yourself. But I understand, of course, that would kind of defeat the point of, you know, buying a phone with Graphene OS pre-installed. So that's understandable. Yeah, there's actually one service that's that's doing it. It's it's a reputable company in, in Europe that I not going to mention here because I'm not affiliated with them in any way. I'm not affiliated with anyone. So that's good. But they are selling Graphene OS devices and they're also offering another service which you have to pay for. It's pretty expensive though. And they're offering to remove um, some of the device components like sensors, microphones, and cameras. What are your thoughts on this? Because Graphene OS has toggles for all of these. So should people worry about remove them, re removing these hardware components physically or are the software toggles enough? I personally think that it's really not worth it. I mean, so what? You fork out quite a fair bit of extra cash usually, you lose waterproofing and you lose hardware. You end up paying more for less. On Android, as part of the security model, say if you, for example, deny a permission for the app to record audio, or on Graphene OS, you deny the ability for sensor data to be accessed, which is what the sensors toggle does. 
the app can't just bypass that. It can't just decide I'm not going to obey what the user has said. It's impossible. The operating system actually prevents the app from just ignoring any of the toggles. And what we're talking about here is say an app actually wanted to bypass it, they would have to actually leverage a vulnerability which bypasses the security model. And that's going to be a very high value exploit which they'd have to use against a device in order to bypass that. And it's not really something that I would say would be within the threat model of many users as that would be a huge security issue which I would imagine the Android security team would get right on top of as soon as possible. Yeah, so this is not something that, that generally people should worry about, but this is something that Edward Snowden did. So for his threat model, you would say that this is pretty reasonable to do. I mean, if you're being targeted by one of the most powerful signals intelligence alliances in the world, y y yeah, I would be pretty damn worried. And honestly, <laughs> I would say your best hope is live in a cave and hope nothing bad happens but yeah i would say for someone with a threat model like snowden which i highly doubt is going to be anyone watching this video per se um yeah it's definitely something that would make sense but for the average person like me and you like it doesn't really make sense like i like honestly if i get targeted by a multi-million dollar exploit chain like one i'm gonna be wow i'm impressed i'm apparently that important because I'm not really that important. I'm not exactly a political figure. I'm not exactly a journalist. I'm not anything like that. It's just unlikely that this sort of this sort of you know high level like nation state level exploit chain is going to actually be used to deploy like spyware or whatever to a device. It's just not realistically going to happen to most people. The reality is is that these people who actually do get hit with it, they're not going to know. You don't even know if there will ever be a trace that, because this is designed to be covert. It's designed to be stealthy. It, 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 it's it's yeah. important to be realistic with what will realistically yeah. actually happen, both on an on a individual that might be targeted like that and just, you know, the average person. In my opinion, the thing to say here is that unless, like, you actually are going to be realistically targeted by a literal multi-million dollar exploit chain, you like, the toggles are trustworthy and honestly i think okay. it, 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 even if you run the stock operating system or graphene os or ios they're reasonably trustable obviously ios is sort of the outlier because they have that you know fear to like tracking toggle which isn't doesn't really follow the um same manner of how the android security model works where it's expected that any toggle you have within the operating system is enforced by the operating system which you can't really do with a tracking toggle I just I just wanted to know your thoughts on uh, using Faraday bags because I, I I would say that that's a gimmick. It's it's not necessary because if you have the toggles, you can just you know toggle the airplane mode on, and you can trust that. You don't have to worry about at least in the graphing ways. You don't have to worry about that leaking some cellular radio data. That's off. It's off. You don't have to put it inside a Faraday bag. I don't know. At least for me personally, I don't think it's not something that I would ever really consider using. I don't think it's really realistically going to be a threat for most people. When I turn on that airplane mode toggle, then there is no cellular uh, connection whatsoever. Like even for like the 911 services, nothing, right? Yeah. So when, you, when you're in airplane mode, all mobile communications are going to be turned off and then you might need to turn off Wi-Fi because, you know, you can have Wi-Fi while you're in airplane mode. So you need to make sure that's turned off. Maybe yeah. you might have Bluetooth on you make sure that's turned off. But honestly, like on a Graphene OS phone, if you're concerned, just turn it off. Like realistically, you, you probably don't have anything to worry about. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's what I think. Um, I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Like if, if, if there is um, an ad adversary in, in, inside your phone and, and you put it inside a Faraday bag, the moment you take it out, they are going to have the connection. So I don't, I don't really see the point. I'm, but I was only just maybe worried about like if you turn off your Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, it still have the scanning features that could be working in the background. You have to disable those manually. So I was just wondering if that's the case with um, the cellular cellular as well. And that's maybe the reason for the Faraday bag, but I guess that's not the case. 
So, I mean, once your phone's in airplane mode, the the radios used to commu- used for communicating with the telecoms network are going to be off. Mm, okay. And yeah, when it comes I'm going to trust the, that. Yeah. When it comes to Wi-Fi and Bluetooth scanning on Graphene OS, by default, um, scanning f- as part of network location is off because we don't use a network location provider. So when you turn off Wi-Fi or when you turn off Bluetooth, it's really off. I mean, that's that's definitely good to hear. I Yeah, I trust the toggles themselves. I don't feel like wasting money on some gimmicks that aren't really useful because like, like you can only use the Faraday bag when you're not using your phone. So at that point, you can just turn it off entirely. I think there's also something, I think there's also something to consider. So a lot of people, but that they want like, I don't know, say a hardware toggle for like the radio or a hardware toggle for like the camera or a hardware toggle for like, I don't know, the microphone or like you say, they might use a Faraday bag. And I think the key thing to realize is that realistically, the only threat you're protecting yourself from is an adversary who has deeply compromised your device already and probably has access to everything already. They're just going to be able to exfiltrate all that data once they, you know, just get a network connection again, which they realistically probably will. And so I don't really think it's that useful as such. And I wouldn't say it's something that people necessarily will grasp instantly, but I do think it's important to recognize that for the average person it's not really going to make any difference and even like people who are like hobbyists and really into security and privacy it still doesn't really make sense because again the security model would have to be completely subverted and for actually using those hardware features or putting a phone in a faraday bag you're most likely going to be assuming that your phone's already been deeply compromised which just isn't going to be the case usually yeah, that that's that's my estimation of that of the situation as well. But some people just seem to be stubborn about this, and I I'm glad that you clarify this, and hopefully people will learn from this as well. Um, I wanted to ask a question about the future of Graphene OS. So on the roadmap, there are some pretty interesting, you know, promises in the future. But what you could what could you say for now? What's in the nearest roadmap for Graphene OS? So. I'd say nearest roadmap at the time of recording this, we're currently writing a proof concept for the duress feature, whereby, say for example, actually no, let's talk about what the user would do to set it up. So the user gets there and they go to settings, security, they go to duress. And they type in, say for example, I don't know, when I type in the passcode, erase me into my phone, the phone will quite literally erase itself. So when you're under duress and you're being forced to enter a password or you might be in a panic and you need to you need to quickly wipe your phone, you can type in the passcode or pin which you've selected and that will wipe your phone. And we're doing that in a way that can reduce the risk for someone interrupting that wipe. So we're doing a threat model around it, which we'll probably release in the near future, where, for example, we'll block all USB devices or turn off all radios the moment you type in the duress passcode and the phone will instantly begin to wipe itself. It's going to wipe all the eSIMs. It's going to wipe all the user data, that kind of thing. Um, also, at the moment, just we're doing general preparation. We're preparing for Android 13 and be quite excited about some of the advancements that's going to bring internally we're developing support for hardened malloc to support memory tagging so that's going to drastically improve the security of graphene os on devices which support memory tagging which we're speculating that maybe the pixel 7 will have it maybe the pixel 8 will have it we're not quite sure but I'd say that's a reasonable timeline for guessing when that might be incorporated formally into the OS and for the feature to be present within the Android ecosystem as a whole. Yeah, that's th- that Duress feature is very exciting. Uh, the memory tagging feature is also exciting. And some 
of the features that are promised in the roadmap that caught my eye as well are maybe moving away from the monolithic Linux kernel and its security model and maybe transitioning to a hypervisor like Zen or something like that. Um, how far into the future is this? I would say it's quite hard to say. I think in the near term, before we would move to a hypervisor-based approach, I think it's more likely that we will deploy an application kernel. So if you want me to give you an example of one that's currently being used in production, Google actually has an application of their own called Gvisor. And for their Google Cloud deployments, for their containers, it sits in between the Linux kernel and the Linux container. So just a brief lowdown, the containers are essentially say, in enterprise or like hosting environments, you might run like a database or your application within a container and you can easily scale it. That's like a pretty horrible explanation of it, but it gets the point across. And it shares the hosts, like, re like it shares the infrastructure of the host. So all the containers are gonna be using the hosts kernel. And by having an application kernel sandwiched in between the Linux kernel and the containers, it means that risk is drastically reduced. So Gvisor, for example, is written in Golang, which means that it's not susceptible to memory corruption issues, much like the Linux kernel would be. And all like, uh, and basically the goal is get as many syscalls as possible, namely the ones which are more risky and more common incorporated into the application kernel, which will reduce the risk of those syscalls being abused. And we want to do something similar like that for Graphene OS. So we'd have an application kernel being used by all apps on the device. And I think that's more likely what we will see getting implemented in the nearish long term, if that comes across correctly. It does, yeah. Um, I would say maybe a few years. Yeah, I'd say that right. would be that would be reasonable, but we yeah. don't really know. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's definitely something to look forward to because um, we can rest assured that the security, the defensive security is going to be um, just as progressive and advanced as the offensive security and probably even better for, for a change, maybe. I mean, it will always be possible to hack into um, a device given enough effort and resources, but it's going to be significantly more difficult. And this is going to be immensely important for like um like you know civil rights and liberties people that are being targeted because they're minorities or activists journalists stuff like that so definitely yeah graphene os is is blowing my mind that it never stops improving um graphene os also implements google play services or google mobile services rather um in a way that is very interesting because um the base uh, the base operating system is completely free of any Google code or Google apps services whatsoever, and that's amazing because it gives you that level of separation from a company, and you you have more privacy that way. But for some features like some notifications and maybe some banking apps only work if you have Play services on. So how exactly did Graphene OS pull this off? considering how protective Google is about its um, play services. So Graphene OS recently, well, not so recently anymore, but Graphene OS has the sandbox Google Play services feature. So what does that mean? So it means you, the user, can install the real, untempered, untouched Google Play apps on your device, and they will run perfectly on the phone. Most of the APIs will work, almost all of them. And they don't get any special privileges. They run within the normal application sandbox, just like any other app. And the user is in full control of all the permissions they grant to it. So how did we do it? Essentially what we've done is within the operating system, we've put in shims. So for those of you who might not be familiar with the terminology, you can think of a shim as rerouting a train, for example. So instead of going directly from A to B, where B might be some sort of privileged integration, you might instead redirect through station C, then go to B. Or you might go instead 
you know what, let's just not go to station B at all, let's go to station D. And in order to reduce that abstraction down, it means instead of using a privileged API, we'll reroute play services to using an API that normal apps can use, or we'll just feed it back dummy data. Play services, for example, on a stock operating system is allowed to get the serial number of the phone. And what we do is we just say, all right, cool. There's no serial number and it doesn't get a serial number. Simple as that. And another one, another thing that we do like play services on the stock operating system technically has access to the IMEI. And you know, it obviously can't do that because it doesn't have the deep system integration. It doesn't have the special permissions which the user can't control, which means that it can access the IMEI. And so it never gets that on Graphene OS because it's running within the normal application sandbox and the user is in full control of what permissions it gets. It's impossible for it to access the IMEI. It's impossible for it to get access to all this deep system integration and monitor what you're doing on the phone. This is an interesting point. So I buy my Pixel device with my credit card. So Google knows that I bought this device. This device has the IMEI in it. If I install Graphene OS on that Pixel device, and then I install a Google Play um, application on that with the well through that through that sandbox implementation, is Google going to be able to correlate these IMEIs? Nope, because they can never get the IMEI while you're running on Graphene OS. So since Android 10, all apps are not allowed to get the IMEI. They literally just can't. They just can't. And because Sandbox Google Play and by that play services on Graphene OS is running within the normal application sandbox and doesn't have any special system permissions, it can't access the IMEI. So there is no identifier that could be tied to my name that Google or any app for that matter that now we are talking about identifiers could access on Graphene OS. Correct. I could consider my phone with Graphene OS to be anonymous. In a sense, yes. Okay, so this is important for a threat model where you want to take your phone to a protest and you don't want to have that. You want to have that essentially as a burner phone. And in some cases, what you could actually do is that you could set up like burner profiles, like ephemeral profiles, and you could erase these profiles when the protest is over or something like that, right? So, but this would make sure that whatever apps I'm using during the protest for a communication or whatever, they are not getting access to any identifiable data, providing that I did my OPSEC op operation security right, like not revealing, re not revealing my true identity to like social media apps or something like that. So there is Graphene OS is actually protecting my identity from the apps that I'm using. Yep, absolutely. And a lot of this is actually built within Android. So actually in AOSP, so let's just forget about Graphene OS for a second. In AOSP, apps can't get access to serial numbers. They can't get access to MAC addresses. They can't get access to IMEIs. They can't get access to IMSIs. They can't get access to any like SIM card serial numbers, like an ICC ID or something like that. And a lot of that has been historically in Graphene OS, but now it's actually all done upstream by Google within the actual core AOSP project. So now the only real thing that we actually have to close off ourselves is the ability for legacy apps to be able to get the serial number and we just give them a zeroed out one. Something I do think is good to mention is that of course Graphene OS can't hide the IMEI or your, your SIM card information or your phone information from your carrier. So inherently by knowing your IMEI, mm. You know, your carrier knows what phone you have. That's just how IMEIs work. And you can't okay. change the IMEI on a production device. So as long as you're connected to the telecoms network, be it with a SIM card in or without a SIM card in, they will be able to potentially get the IMEI of your device. And your carrier inherently will always know the MZ because, you know, they're the ones that issued it. And, you know, they can, of course, associate the MZ to your IMEI. And there's a whole host of, you know, different things to be aware of when it comes to telecoms and identifiers. So in the scenario you mentioned of the protest, for example, you'd ensure that you have your phone in airplane mode, potentially, if that's within your threat model, to ensure that your IMEI or your IMSI couldn't be used to correlate you to who you really are 
to the event that you were attending. Mm -hmm. You could you could potentially use it as a Wi-Fi only device because that would be anonymous. Yes, yes, and there are plenty of people in our community who do that. We even have people in the community who use Ethernet adapters over USB and use that to you know use their phone, browse entertainment, do whatever they want to do. Okay, well, th this is this is significant to hear because these identifiers they are a pain in the ass. So it's interesting that that Google actually went away to remove them. So like like remove the apps from accessing them, which is pretty interesting. So like only it's really only the carrier and the cellular network that's the big threat here. That's like the big hole. Yes, but I believe that the telecoms network will always be insecure and i think that's just mm. inherent of how telecoms work and honestly unless some crazy development happens in well i'm still alive i don't expect that to see i don't expect to see any change of that in my lifetime i think it's something that people inherently have to accept that the telecoms network is insecure and most likely for the foreseeable future will always be insecure and as always with any network, be it TCP, IP, or, you know, your regular telecoms network, you should be distrusting it. Yeah, I, I, I really hate phones. I like fo phone numbers. I, I hate using SIM cards. I just I just find it to be too invasive that you have to really, re uh, re really not relieve, reveal yourself to the network. And even if you're using a burner SIM, if you can get it, it's only a one one time thing. The moment you connect it to your device, it's going to be connected to the IMEI, and that's going to be tied to your location in some way or another. So it's just limiting your ability to use your device repeatedly as an anonymous device. So I just hate that. So airplane mode, Wi-Fi only device, that's the way to go for me. Um, in your previous talk uh, with the Android Bytes guys, you were pretty adamant about making sure that people have a device with up-to-date OEM support and I, I want to hear from you how important it is to transition to a new device that is still receiving security updates from an old device that is not and if, I if, if I'm reaching end-of-life support how quickly should I move away how important this is really in your opinion so I think something that people need to bear in mind and I'm going to do quite a blunt analogy to this. You wouldn't connect a Windows XP computer, which hasn't had a single security update for years, to the internet. You just wouldn't. And I don't see, like, I think there's a sort of a general consensus around people that it's not that important for phones, but the exact same thing applies. And I think people need to be aware that once the OEM drops support for their device, you aren't getting full security coverage anymore. And what I mean by that is that you rely on the OEM to provide security updates for the firmware. Any blobs that might be on the phone, like, for example, I don't know, say on the Pixel 6, for example, Broadcom is providing the GPS firmware and a few blobs for that. You, you're relying on Google and Broadcom to distribute that to the device and to you the end user and once you know once the pixel 6 is say end of life it's not going to be reasonably secure anymore it's not going to be reasonably private anymore because as time goes on and on more and more vulnerabilities which have been publicly disclosed are going to be possible to use against it and i think it's something that not many people understand per se and I think because of the prominence of, you know, the desktop computing model where people might not actually be aware that it's quite poorly done in um, traditional desktop computing compared to mobile devices. Like, I think it's something that people don't clearly understand because of the way the desktop security model works and how they just might straight not straight not be aware of it. Like, I'm talking to you right now from my Microsoft Surface, which it's full firmware updates as well as full operating system updates. So say, for example, my embedded controller in my laptop has a security update. I'm going to get updates for that directly from Microsoft. Say there's a vulnerability in the UEFI implementation on my laptop. Microsoft's going to make an update for that and push it to my laptop. And generally, 
a lot of OEMs aren't going to be doing that when it comes to desktops or they're going to be heavily neglecting it and they're not going to be doing it consistently. And I think because of that attitude and people not really fully understanding the implications that has, they're not really aware of the risks that are exposed to your mobile phone or really any electronics that no longer receive support from the OEM that they may well potentially be vulnerable to security issues which cannot be patched reasonably. Like, even if we had unlimited engineering resources, like, you know, Graphene OS had, I don't know, a million highly skilled developers, yeah, we still could not reasonably maintain security patches, you know, and properly sort out any issues that would be on a device once it's been, once the OEM has dropped support on it. And I think we have to make it very clear that we are all four have devices having longer lifetimes. But the unfortunate reality is, is that when it comes to preserving security and privacy, you really are shackled by how long your OEM decides to support your devices for. That's a touchy subject because I don't want to throw away my phone if it works. It feels bad to do it, you know, like not for security reasons, but, you know, for other reasons, like the environment and stuff like that. Like you don't want to just spend money on a new phone. It's so expensive. But you're saying that you just you just have to bite through it because it's just so important. I think it is quite unfortunate that we're at a point where quite literally you are going to have to sell your old phone, which works potentially perfectly fine just because the OEM has dropped support for it. And I do think that when it comes to this, Apple is actually a leader um, in spite of all their right to repair issues, which I'm very well aware of and they definitely kind of suck at, to be honest. Um, they are first class when it comes to software support and they're supporting phones for years. Like, I think they still support, I, I believe, the iPhone 6S, if I remember right. And that came out in like 2015. Like, that's a huge amount of support. And that's just unheard of in the Android and the ecosystem. Google at the moment is a complete market leader when it comes to security support with the, with the launch of the Pixel 6. Giving five years of updates is a pretty big thing in the Android ecosystem. Previous Pixel devices only had three years of support. So I think we are moving, I think as an industry, we're getting there but it's awfully slow and there's still major issues. I think it's not great that I think five years even still is not great. Like at least 10 years would be awesome. But, you know, unfortunately we're quite constrained by things like, you know, Linux kernel, LTS support timelines and other miscellaneous issues like, you know, SOC vendor support timelines. And obviously, you know, say like, I don't know, Broadcom might, I don't know, drop support for a GPS chip that's in the Pixel 6 seven years from now. You have to bear in mind a multitude of parties when it comes to maintaining a hardware stack. And it's quite difficult to do. But I think Google is taking the right steps in order to making it more of a feasible possibility that Android devices will be able to have much longer lifespans in the future with the launch of projects such as generic kernel images, and making it far easier for OEMs to move to newer kernel versions. And, you know, they're drastically reducing the workload, which needs to happen by OEMs and SOC vendors. But of course, you know, they're still quite heavily constrained by, you know, how long they determine to support a device for in reference to, you know, OEMs and SOC vendors and chip vendors and so on. Yeah, I'm generally frustrated by this because I really don't want to buy a new phone, but I'm going to have to. And I was just wondering, like, how long could I wait? Like, Pixel 6a is not yet out. So could I wait a couple of months or should I just get a new phone just, like, the moment the end of life support hits I mean, the end date? Ideally, the moment your phone runs out of security coverage, say, for example, I don't know, the Pixel 3a next month, it's going to get its final security update. Pretty much set in stone at this point. And... I'd say for June, July, you definitely want to get a new phone because ultimately 
those vulnerabilities that are disclosed every month on around the fifth for Android devices, they're, they're all going to be disclosed publicly. It won't be too long before adversaries start actually using them in the wild and, you know, other threat actors, you know, start using them for, you know, malicious purposes. So I think it's important to be aware of that and ensure that, you know, you don't get caught in the crossfire. I think that alone is enough of a reason to seriously, you know, rapidly move to a new device. And it's unfortunate, like me, myself, I love my Pixel 5. It was a gift to me, in fact, but I'm going to be very sad when it comes to the end of its life and I have to move to a new device. I'm probably going to hold it dearly for the rest of my life because it means quite a lot to me. But um, yeah, I guess we got to kind of deal with um, short support timelines until we get to a future where devices can last for years upon years. Yeah, I hope that we will have that future because, um, I mean, with all the shortages and everything, I, I think it would make more sense for companies to just support devices for longer instead of just like enforcing this, um, you know, like planned obsoles obsolescence or something like that. I don't know what it is. I think it's going to become a very pressing issue towards the future. I mean, at the moment, we are heavily reliant on just a few fabs, you know, like TSMC and so on. And I mean, if something goes wrong, then, you know, the entire electronic supply chain is ruined. So maybe in the future, that's going to have an impact on device support. Maybe it won't. Maybe it's just going to lead to price gouging. I mean, we got to be optimistic, but honestly, it's such an unpredictable situation in the world right now. It's very hard to say what will happen in the future. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just going to say something optimistic about it. I, I think that companies like Google and Apple, they are going to benefit from people um, using their services, even on older devices. So I think they would be incentivized um, monetar monetarily to support devices for longer instead of people not having access to, to those devices. So I think, you know, for as long as they can say, well, we need to have more people use our services rather than have less people use our services, I think they're going to realize that it's better to have longer OEM support and yeah, that's just me <laughs> trying to be a bloomer. Unfortunately, it's a very complex issue. I think that even with industry-wide coordination, it's going to be years until something reasonable gets worked out and consumers can get a device which gets full security updates for a very long time. But I definitely do think it's possible. So what if, what if Google starts making its own hardware from scratch well at the moment google has an internal design team and as far as i'm aware they're relying on foxconn to manufacture the phones they're relying on um a lot of samsung's shannon and exynos um intellectual property in order to build their own soc and i believe they're using open titan or at least some sort of proprietary distribution of it in some way, shape or form for the Titan M2. And that's their own silicon as well. And I think there is real opportunity for Google to become the market leader. Well, it already is when it comes to security support, but I definitely think that as time goes on, they'll be able to make it even longer. And I think we'll be able to have devices which are supported for maybe even 10 years in my lifetime. Absolutely. But Ideally, we could go even further. Oh, man. I mean, 10 years, that's um, un unthinkable in today's day and age. Like, the best we can get is like three and a half years. I mean, now with the Pixel 6, it's five years. But that's the first generation that's uh, extended th this far. Like, pre previous devices, it's abysmal. And it's it's really unique. Like, all other Android devices, other Android uh, OEMs, they're not even supporting for that long. So, yeah, I mean, 10 years... Oh my God, that would be truly amazing. Yeah, I think that I think it's going to be a great change for the industry. And it's going to be very eco-friendly if devices start being a lot more or less throw it away and forget it, which is quite unfortunate that we live in a world where that is quite commonly the case. But I think it will get better over time. Yeah, I think maybe Google is thinking about this with their recent change to this sort of uh, subscri uh, subscription model where you can even pur purchase the Pixel 6 and you would pay monthly, I guess. I'm not I'm not sure if I'm just making this up, but I think you could just purchase this based uh, with monthly payments and you would have access to some 
premium Google services. I don't use any Google service outside of my YouTube account. So I don't know what premium Google services there are for people to use on their phones. But I think th they are trying to move away in this and this model could actually like um, subsidize longer OEM support for them. I think it's less of an issue of money. I think it's more of an issue of simply downstream vendors uh, quite difficult to deal with and coordinate all together. So I think it's going to mm. really sort of reveal itself as the years go by. But it is, it's such a complex problem. I mean, not even in Android, just across the industry, it's such a complex problem that it, it's quite hard to point a finger. And I think there's definitely some cases where a device could absolutely be feasibly supported. Like, say for example, like the Pixel 5 has pretty much almost the exact same guts internally as the Pixel 5a. And the 5a's got an extra year of support because it came out roughly a year later. Like, I think for devices like that, where you could absolutely get more support, it it does make you think, you know, the support contracts that Google has with, you know, the SOC vendor and people who make the chips and the firmware, it's probably quite restrictive. And again, it's quite hard to really point a finger at who's to blame for the, lot, the, sh the sh overly short life cycles when, you know, us as consumers, we want far longer support life cycles. Yeah, I think the best way to maybe um, conceptualize this would be that, that there are many, there are too many snowflakes in the avalanche and n n none of them is going to blame itself for it. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a whole industry problem, as you said. And yeah, I mean, I, I'm very happy for the talk that we had today and I don't have any more questions, but if you want to add anything that you feel like would be relevant to what we have discussed today, feel free to to do so. I think that I think we did a pretty brilliant summary, if I might say myself myself. Definitely. I'm I'm very happy for this and I hope that people um would have enjoyed this talk and I'm I'm pretty positive that they would. And yeah, I'm I'm definitely looking forward to any future uh, interview or talks that you would want to do with me. I'm definitely open. Um, it's fun to talk to you. It's very enjoyable, very educational. And if you have more time in the future, I'm all in. This is amazing. Absolutely. I'd absolutely, it'd be my absolute pleasure to come back on again. Thank you for that. Really, I really appreciate that. It means a lot. Um, and, and definitely the audience will appreciate this because I've, I think this is pretty rare. And I'm not sure if, if uh, developers like yourself realize how important it is for you guys to come to the people and speak your mind freely and explain what you're working on, explain the issues that you're trying to solve because it's just as important for people to understand the why behind all of these things, all of, the, the, all of these projects as it is important to understand how to use them and what to use them for. So again, I'm, I'm really thankful. It's an absolute pleasure to come on. And it's always great to discuss, um, you know, in reasonable technical detail with someone, you know, what we do at Graphy Nurse. And it's great. I enjoyed being on the podcast and I hope the audience will as well. Yeah, thank, thank you, Gabe. That's, that's amazing. And thank you to everyone who is listening this far. And yeah, one more thing. You should you should definitely say how people can follow you or Graphene OS and how can they support you in, in Graphene OS. Absolutely. So at Graphene OS, we do have a donation page. So if any of you think, hey, this cause isn't too crazy, we might support you, then feel free to go to grapheneos.org slash donate. If you're interested in installing Graphene OS into your Pixel device, then I highly urge you to go to graphenos.org, read the documentation. It's really feature-filled and very dense. Not all of it will be understandable, but if you need any clarification, you need any support, you have any questions, you come straight over to our community, which you can find in the contact area of our website. And we also have the web installer, which you can go to graphenos.org slash install slash web, which allows you to trivially install the operating system straight from your web browser onto a supported Pixel device. If you want to follow me on Twitter, then my at is at Dev. 
If you want to follow the GrapheneOS project, then it's at GrapheneOS.